This is ABTV, Animal Bites Television. I wish I could say all the years I've been keeping snakes have just been smooth and anyone that kept a pet snake was going to just have an awesome experience. But the truth is, whenever you're keeping any living animal, and in particular reptiles, there's going to potentially be issues that you're going to have to deal with. So this week's show, I'm going to talk about the most common problems and what the best solutions are. My name is Brian Barczyk. I'm no zoologist, just a guy with a passion for animals. And that passion often takes me on animal adventures around the world. This week we're at BHB's headquarters, giving you solutions for the most common problems you'll have when keeping a pet snake. You're watching Snake Bites. You know, for 27 years I've been keeping and breeding snakes, so I've kind of seen every issue that you could possibly see, from really common issues to really unusual issues. But I really want to spend time talking about what the most common possibilities that you're going to face if you ever keep a pet snake. And listen, most of them are really simple to cure if you just listen to my advice. And the number one thing that I hear more than anything is that my snake won't shed well. Well, this is a little lemon blast ball python, and as you can see, it's really stuck and shed. It just came out of the blue, and it tried to shed, and it's just really stuck on. I want to first talk about why it probably is stuck and shed. 99.9% .9 of the time, when a snake is stuck and shed, it's a humidity issue. And in the wintertime, our furnaces are kicking up, and we really have a much drier climate in here, so we're always combating stuck sheds. Now, this is a pretty bad one. We typically don't have this much of a problem and this one's really stuck in our humidity is about 45 to 50 percent in this particular room I'd like it to be about 60 percent to have really good sheds but this snake in particular has really dried out but there's a simple solution to it so today we're going to solve the problem and I'm going to tell you exactly how to do it if you listen to this advice trust me your snake won't shed but it's going to take a little time so we're going to throw this puppy in shed we're going to check later in the show and show you how to get the shed off so you want to get something like a plastic shoe box or a tupperware anything that you know this particular one has holes it doesn't have to have holes because you're not going to have it in there that long but uh, uh something that will hold water obviously and hold the snake inside of it uh, and what you want to do is is warm water not hot water not cold water warm water and just basically get a nice temperature you know you probably want it about upper 80s lower 90s as far as temperature or just warm to the touch you know again not hot to the touch and this is the thing people sometimes don't put enough water and you want the snake to be able to be totally submerged but you don't want it so deep that it could potentially drown but i will say for two two and a half decades i've been soaking snakes i've never had one drown yet so knock on uh aluminum here that doesn't ever happen but I highly doubt that it will and just give it a good like maybe you know inch or so of water again nice lukewarm water the lid is going to go on so let's go get the snake put it in here take the next steps so here's the thing guys I talk to a ton of people and tell them you gotta soak your snake if it's stuck in shed and so often times people are like I did and it still won't come off the truth is people I think don't understand that when you soak a snake you've got to be really patient you know maybe you want to put it in there for five minutes you think it's going to come off it's not probably going to do it if it's really stuck like this lemon blast i'm talking like at least a half an hour even an hour is not going to hurt the animal you know certainly check up on it you know you don't want to just leave it and walk away and just oh it'll be okay but for the most part just make sure that soaks a nice long time. You gotta remember that skin is really dry and it's really stuck on there. So that moisture has to have time to get in there. No less than a half an hour soak. And like I said, an hour is not even a problem. Now let's back up just for one second and some things that you can kind of do to avoid having a stuck said snake. Again, we saw that the humidity is about 50% here, which really isn't that bad, but you know, it's still a little bit drier because of that forced air in the winter time. So basically one thing you wanna do is give a really nice big water dish so we usually fill our water dishes a little more than halfway just so that when we're shutting and opening the cage that it doesn't spill as much during the winter I might want to fill it almost all the way again more water in the cage the higher humidity within the actual cage itself the other thing you can do is just spray the animal down with water maybe once or twice a week keep that humidity up in the cage keep that moisture there especially when you start to see your snake going into shed and going blue the more humidity give it a spray even if it's once a day it'll really avoid the stuck shed but if you have the stuck shed you know how to soak it we'll come back to this guy after we're done showing some other stuff I guarantee you I'll show you some tricks how easy it is to get that shed skin off I want to talk about 
if your snake is not feeding, but I have to really, really stress to you a couple things first is that if you have an older snake that's not feeding, it may just be on a feeding fast. If it's a corn snake or a king snake, maybe it's cooling down for hibernation. If it's a ball python, they typically fast at 600 to 1,000 grams very consistently. I mean, maybe once a year they'll go off food for two or three months. Do not force feed or assist feed an animal just because it went off food. If it looks healthy, it's doing fine, do not do it. This is really for someone that buys a baby ball python, something that's fresh, or if you're hatching baby ball pythons and you have animals that don't feed, I would say probably one out of every 120 to 150 ball pythons that we keep just won't start feeding on their own. Um, completely healthy animals, 100% healthy, but for whatever reason, they just don't want to accept food on their own. Now, some people quite honestly have a feeling like, hey, it's natural selection. If they're not gonna eat, just let them die. I don't believe that personally. I think that, because I've seen animals that have had to assist feed a few times, three times, four times, five times, and then start feeding, and I've had them 10 or 12 years, and they've thrived, and their babies have thrived. So me personally, when a snake doesn't eat, I'm wanting to do everything I can do to get it to eat within reason, okay? Now, secondly, I never suggest force feeding, okay? I only suggest assist feeding. Force feeding isn't really doing much help. Yeah, it's keeping the animal alive, but you're really not helping it develop the need to start feeding, okay? A ball python like this fire champin, which is a champagne pinstripe, I usually let it go about four weeks without feeding before I'll start to assist feed. Now that's when it was a baby, so it's never eaten for four weeks before I start. That means that basically about seven to 10 days after it's hatched, it sheds, I offer its first meal, and then I'll offer once a week until about four weeks. And on that fourth week, if it hasn't eaten, I'll start to assist feed. Again, please don't just start shoving stuff down snake's throat. It's only gonna hurt it. And again, if your ball python, say it's a baby and it's eaten four weeks in a row and then skips two weeks, do not assist feed or force feed because you're only gonna stress the animal out. So I hope you guys understand what I'm saying here. Don't hurt your animals, okay? But if you're in a situation like this fire champagne, I wanna show you what I'm gonna do. First thing I wanna do is take a frozen fuzzy about the size of its head. This one is just a little bit bigger than its head, but roughly about that size, right? Now what I wanna do is very, very gently get behind its head. And what I'll do is I'll support the body with this part of my hand and I just pinch right behind the head and I'm trying not to stress the animal as much as possible. So I wanna get a nice gentle grip that's not gonna to be too aggressive for the animal. Kind of keep it in, see like that? Doesn't seem like it's stressed out that bad. I wanna take the, the very nose of that fuzzy and I just wanna pry its mouth open like this. Now what I'm doing is I don't wanna just put it in its mouth because it's just gonna spit it out. So I am pushing it down just a little bit. So basically I want that head to get down into the gullet of that snake, just past it. And, uh, and once you get it on there, you can actually just push down just a little bit and actually squeeze its head just a little bit so those teeth actually puncture into it. Now what I wanna do is I actually hold it up like this because if you just set it down right away, it's gonna just be flailing, right? So if you hold it up like this, it kinda writes itself and it goes, okay, what's going on? And it calms down. Now that, that mouse is in there, we're hoping it's gonna decide to eat it. I'll gently, gently set it down at this point, hoping not to get it to freak out. And you can see this one's kind of going. And, and listen, if it does that, it might calm down. It might spit it out. If it spits it out, we just start the process over again, okay? Now, assist feeding, the reason why it's so important is the fact that you're actually causing the animal to feed, okay? You're not just pushing it down its throat. It's actually doing the feeding mechanism. And I noticed that after, like I said, two, three, four, five assist feedings, they typically always eat on their own. So let's just go ahead and watch this guy eat. Another issue that I hear quite often is regurgitation or throwing up in snakes, and it's certainly a much more common thing in, say, colubrids, corn snakes and king snakes, than it is boas and pythons, but it can happen in boas and pythons too. I want to talk about a few things why it could happen and what the real protocol is to make sure it's not an issue with the snake itself, right? So basically, to start with, regurgitation is typically when an animal is not got a sufficient heat source potentially, so maybe the hot spot's a little too cold, or maybe you just fed 
too big of a meal. Again, boas and pythons can seem to absorb really large meals. We've all seen pictures of snakes that have had like a pig in them or a, a cow or something like that. Whereas colubrids are, have a much more delicate stomach. So if you feed a snake like this Mexican black king, it could probably eat a small adult mouse. But if you fed it two adult mice or a really big adult mouse, there's a chance it's going to throw up even with a decent hot spot. Now, so if you make sure the hot spot's good, you make sure the food size is good, the only thing you have to worry about if it does happen is what you need to do. The only way it's typically fatal to a snake is if it regurges multiple times in a row. And one thing you don't want to do is feed this a large mouse, have it throw up. Next week, feed it another large mouse, have it throw up. And then three weeks later, you're feeding it another large mouse and having it throw up. Because at that point, the trauma to that animal throwing up is so extreme. You gotta remember, snakes' stomachs go one way. They don't go the other way. So when it's coming back up, it's actually sometimes damaging the stomach line, the esophagus, all kinds of things. Because again, it's not like throwing up something that's that's like mush, it's really like a little mouse or a rat that have claws and teeth and everything else. So going the wrong way is really traumatic for a snake. So what you wanna do is let that snake heal a little bit. This is the protocol. If a snake like this throws up a big mouse, what I'm gonna to wanna to do is give it one week completely off of food. The next week, you don't even feed it. So 10 to 14 days later, you offered a meal. You wanna go at least half the size of the prey item that it recently threw up. If it takes that down, keeps it down, you can slowly over a month long period work back to your way to a normal sized meal. As long as you make that protocol, the thing you do, you won't have a problem with the animal becoming a chronic regurgitator and potentially a lethal problem. So now I'm gonna talk about something that's pretty controversial and a lot of snake breeders and even snake keepers don't wanna even talk about it, but I really wanna give you guys the power to be able to deal with things that are sometimes you know, relatively common when you're keeping reptiles. And that, of course, is snake mites. Snake mites are a little parasitic bug that actually get on snakes and they will actually suck the blood of the snakes but they're very nomadic too right so they typically don't stay on a snake for a long time they'll actually travel sometimes eight or ten feet in a night time because they're nocturnal so that's why when you have a mite here very soon you're gonna have mites all the way down there the chances are if you keep snakes for 10 years 12 years 15 years at some point you're gonna get a snake mite now why is that you could buy a snake that might have snake mites. You could go to a reptile show and maybe three tables down from the table you bought from had mites and overnight it traveled to their thing. Maybe you bring them in on rodents, maybe you bring on bedding. And that's what I want to talk about right now. You can see our setups now are paper, and that's it. When we were dealing with snake mites, we had issues because we were dealing with cypress mulch, that bedding. And what happens is those mites crawl off the snake and they get in the bedding and they lay eggs in the bedding. And for whatever reason, it seemed like even when we dumped out the entire cage and we put new bedding in, they would come back at some point. We've been keeping paper for about 10 to 12 months now. We have not seen one snake mite in this collection in over 10 months. As a matter of fact, what we always use, and I'm gonna talk about the use, is Prevenamite, which is a great, you know, people call it PAM. It's a great way to get rid of snake mites. And I'm gonna show you how the proper way to use this product, but the truth is, this bottle has been sitting around for almost 10 months. It took me a while to even find it because we haven't had any need for it. But again, I think that you know the fact that you want to get rid of mites because no one wants bugs in their collection, but the fact that people overblow it like somehow it's the plague is, is a little bit crazy. Now, don't get me wrong. You don't want them. You prefer not to have them. But listen, if you keep snakes long enough, you might have a chance to do it. So the couple things really quick, you know, snakes again are gonna be on the actual snake itself, right? So one of the things I'll do is sometimes I'll just rub my hand on a snake when I was having issues and just look to see if there's any black bugs or anything like that. You can certainly look, sometimes they'll be in like the eye caps. You can also look in the water because a lot of times snakes will wanna sit in the water to drown the mites. That's the, in nature what would happen. You know, they would wanna get rid of those parasites so they try to drown them. So sometimes you'll see little black bugs in there. So those are the things to identify the mites if you end up actually having it. But again, they're relatively easy to get rid of if you have the right system. So again, strip the cage down, whether it's aspen bedding, pine bedding, cypress mulch, whatever, and go to paper. Even if you want to go back to that at a future date, for a month or two, keep paper like we do all the time and never have a mite problem. But when you're using a product like Prevenamite, the one thing you don't want to do is spray the actual snake because that can actually be problems. You can have neurological issues 
issues with the snake, you can actually kill your snake with products like Prevenamite. Um, so you don't want to do that. The way you want to do it is first thing is take the water out. You don't want that water because what happens is the aerosol in here that gets in the cage is going to get into that water. You don't want the snake to drink that. The second thing you want to do, remove the snake. I know you go, well, hey, there's mites on the snake. Why are you taking the snake out to try to prevent it? Because mites are nomadic, they're gonna move. And when they move, they're gonna get killed if they are on something like Prevenamite. So what you wanna do is once the water is gone, the snake is out of the cage, you just wanna take the Prevenamite and give it a nice spray all along the cage like this. Make sure you're getting it nice and dead. You see that fog? That's what you want because what happens is as that aerosol goes down, it's gonna coat the entire cage. Now again, what I was talking about is that you know, there might be some mites in the cage from the snake itself that came off the snake, but for the most part, most of those mites are probably on their snake themselves, right? Now, one of the things I would do if you kept a lot of snakes is treat the entire area because again, those are nomadic. They climb out of this cage. You wanna make sure the next cage and the next cage and the next cage are prevented from mites or you're just gonna have a problem where, okay, this snake doesn't have mites anymore, but that one does. So like when we eradicated mite issues from our collection, what we were doing is we were cleaning the entire collection, putting on paper and treating the entire room. Every single snake in the entire room was treated with Prevenamite. And it took us about a month and a half of continuously doing that maybe every you know 10 to 14 days. And then all of a sudden they disappeared and they never ever came back. So you wanna let that rest for probably you know, a good two minutes or so. Make sure all the aerosol is, is gone. You don't want them to ever breathe that in. And once there's a good coat, go ahead, put the water back in put the snake back in and again keep in mind now we're just pretending that the snake has mites so you might have mites on your hands or your clothes or anything like that don't go touching other snakes make sure you're cleaned up really good before you move on to the next thing and you basically just shut the cage again if you repeat that say I think they say every 30 days but I did it about every 14 days just to make sure um, as those snake mites crawl off the snake they're gonna get onto that little those little aerosol balls of death of mites and they're gonna those mites are gonna die and that's how you eradicate mites. And trust me, speaking from experience, it's the only way you're gonna get rid of mites is to go through that process. All right, so back to my soaking snake. It's probably been about an hour since I put it in the soak. Uh, really probably wanna leave it a little bit longer to be totally honest with you, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Now I'm gonna give you guys the cheapest tip that I've ever given you guys before and it's this right here. Does anyone know what that is? This is actually a rubber thumb for counting money. You can buy them at any office store. A pack of four of these I think cost $1.09. So for about 25 cents, this is gonna be your best friend right here. Whenever you have a shed issue with the snake, I love this thing right now. So, so essentially, you know, I'm just gonna check it out. The water's still relatively warm because it's in a warm room. And again, you can kind of see that, although I would, again, I'd probably leave this in for another half hour if I did, didn't want to demonstrate this to you, but it certainly has loosened up. And basically what I do is I just put this rubber thumb on right here and I just really gently rub the skin off, you know, and you always want to go from front to back with the scales. You don't want to go against the scales because you're going to actually damage the scales. And this thing grabs, you can see, look at all these little pieces on there, right? Grabs pretty good. So don't really rub it in really hard because you can actually hurt the animal, but you just kind of gently get it and just rub along. Look at how easy that skin is coming off. And again, if I left it in there for another half hour, it would come off even more simply than it is right now. But you can certainly see, look at that. Just I can almost do it just with my finger right there. It just was a matter of giving that animal a little bit of time to soak, letting that moisture get in. Look at how easy that's coming off right there, right? And when we put this guy in here, this thing was stuck like you couldn't believe, like almost like cement. And look at how easy it's coming off right now. Look at that. All right, see? Now that's basically it. That's how you got to do it right there. Now. The head is a little bit more difficult, right? Because you've got a couple things going on. Number one, you know, you gotta hold the animal. It's kind of stressing out a little bit. So try to be as gentle as you possibly can. But the eye caps are gonna be your number one issue. A lot of times you can actually rub all the skin off the head and everywhere else, but then the eye caps are still gonna be on. Again, that's where this rubber thumb is gonna be amazing. So all you need to do is just, again, from front to back, just gently rub the eye and that eye cap is actually gonna pop off in one piece. So it's pretty cool. Again, be gentle with this. This could hurt the animal and try to be as gentle as you can with the animal itself. Giving it another half an hour to soak would probably even make it more gentle for the animal itself. But as you can see, stuck shed is not an issue if you soak it long enough. As you can see, when you're keeping any live animal and in particular snakes, there's gonna be issues that arise 
And you know what? If you do the right things, it's not the end of the world. So I hope some of these tips will help you or maybe share with other people that need that type of help so that their animal and your experience can be a great one for sure. And there's going to be other issues that come up that I didn't cover. So go ahead and comment down below in the comments and let me know what issues maybe I can address in future episodes. Or hey, even if you have a solution to those issues down below, let us know. Share with others and hopefully we can save a bunch of really cool animals and just keep the experience of keeping reptiles an awesome one. And as always, I was Facebooking and tweeting my way through it. So make sure to follow me over at Snakebites TV and on Instagram at snakebites.tv. Until next week, you've been watching Snake Bites. Hi, I'm Peter Birch, an Aussie bloke who loves wildlife. My respect for nature started when I was a young boy in rural New South Wales. Since then, it's exploded into an obsession. New episodes every Thursday only on Animal Bites TV.